It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Um, before I begin, Speaker, I, I do want to extend on behalf of the Ontario PC Caucus our, our deepest condolences to the family, um, friends, and colleagues of Peter Worthington. Uh, the man was a giant uh, in, uh, in media, he was a leader. Uh, he is a great Canadian, and he'll be deeply, deeply missed in this province of Ontario. Um, question to the Finance Minister. Minister, uh, last year's budget by your predecessor claimed uh, $2 billion in annual savings from a wage freeze on all government workers. Uh, this year's budget removes any reference whatsoever to a mandatory wage freeze. Instead, you use soft terms like you propose to, quote, work together to get outcomes. I ask the finance minister, um, without a wage freeze, how are you going to find those $2 billion in annual savings? Thank you. <laughs> minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I, I think you actually read part of the budget. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Speaker, and he makes reference to the tone of working together and collaborating and working for the benefit of the people of Ontario. That's right. That's exactly what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. And we've proven that we've been able to control spending at below 1% year over year. It's why we exceeded our targets last year by $5 billion, Mr. Speaker. We've negotiated and collaborated with the broader public sector, and we're dealing with our compensation review by maintaining our envelope at zero. That's very clear in the budget. We're working together for the benefit of the people. You should be working with us as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Well, well, Speaker, there's not much to work with in the finance minister's budget, quite frankly. You, sir, chose to increase the deficit. It should have gone down. You're piling on $20 billion more in, in debt, putting more of a burden on the back of a newborn uh, here in Ontario uh, because you cannot make the decisions necessary to hold line on spending. In fact, Minister, you've gone in the opposite direction by ramping up spending and throwing out the window. Uh, even the small steps we finally got uh, Prem Premier McGuinty and Minister Duncan to come around to, that was an across-the-board mandatory wage freeze and arbitration reform. Um, I, I did read your budget in detail. My, my economics background, Speaker, budgets are actually pleasure reading for somebody like me, but I took no pleasure in the fact that they dropped the wage freeze altogether. Minister, Question. why did you throw out a mandatory wage freeze that could save us $2 billion a year that you yourself had previously voted for? Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, the budget is all about creating jobs, helping people in their everyday lives, and tackling and eliminating the deficit in a very pragmatic, practical way. We're not taking extreme positions. We're trying to our utmost to collaborate and initiate those positive changes for the benefit of the people. But the Leader of the Opposition just talks about his economics background. Well, it's interesting because not long ago, the critic of the opposition sent me a package of their projections, a projections which would necessitate, necessitate mathematics. Well, it's just so, and I'll, if I could give this to the page, please, and if you can provide it to the leader of the opposition. Here is their projections. It is over a billion dollars off. It doesn't add up. He himself has been cut off by his own party for reckless spending, and now with these, with these projections that don't even equate, he's now anticipating that he can not only balance the budget a year earlier, he pretends that he's going to be able to— The member from Prince Edward Hastings come to order. Final supplementary. I, I quite frankly don't know what to say about the increasingly bizarre performance of the finance minister on um, a very um, basic question. You know, that quite frankly I puts puts into question his competence to take on such an important matter of actually getting the books back in the balance of the province of Ontario, make sure we actually reduce spending, not increase it. The deficit actually comes down so you can balance the books, but you've gone in the other direction, and that's clearly why, Speaker, the PC party believes the only way to get Ontario back on track to bring good jobs back to our province, to get government to live within its means, just like families do every day, is to actually change the team, to change the government of the province of Ontario to get us back on track. Let me, um, let me try a, a third time, um, Minister, and I, I appreciate anything you send across to me, but what I appreciate is a, a yes or no answer uh, on a very basic question. If you want to write it down, the question. Screen, you want to answer my question. 
Um, how are you going to actually balance the books? Did you actually toss out the window a mandatory wage freeze, yes or no, and Thank where you. are you going to find the $2 billion? Mr. Speaker, the only bizarre issue here is the numbers presented by the opposition, which don't add up. He has put this. The member from Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. Mr. Speaker, this is in fact very serious. It requires serious leadership and it requires numbers that add up. The member opposite has put forward a YouTube to talk about their projections, which don't equate by over a billion dollars. And furthermore, they're estimating that they're going to be able to balance the books, knowing the challenges ahead, Order. by cutting their revenues by $5 billion. And somehow they're going to be able to balance the books. That is fantasy, Mr. Speaker. We on this side of the House are doing what's necessary to control our spending. We're being disciplined. We're being determined. We've proven that four years running. Next year's deficit That's projection right. is a billion dollars lower because of the steps that we're taking. Read the budget. Thank it's you. very clear what we're doing. You should be supporting. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the Leader of the Opposition. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Speaker. Back to the, uh, the Finance Minister. Um, no, we're not going to support a Liberal budget that digs a hole deeper and causes problems in Ontario. Uh, my, um, my concern, again, the, the Finance Minister um, not, not answering my question, if he's cancelling the mandatory wage freeze, where he'll find the $2 billion, that will dig the hole deeper. Um, the word arbitration appears nowhere in the 300 plus words in the budget papers either, so you've obviously tossed out binding arbitration reform. Given that you've tossed out two cost control measures that we finally got your predecessor to come around to before they closed down the legislature, why is it, uh, Finance Minister, that you in fact go the opposite direction with 20 new spending initiatives? How is that affordable when we're already deep in debt? Minister Finance. Mr. Speaker, this is very much a budget for Ontario by Ontarians. We have sought out a lot of input from a lot of people. We have a lot of issues that we share in common. There's a lot of fiscal matters that are before us. We're doing everything necessary to tackle and eliminate the budget and the deficit, and we're on target. We're on a path to balance, and it's very clear as how we get there. One of them is to maintain and restrain our compensation. We've made it clear that it's at zero going forward. We can work within that envelope, but what we need to do is be determined be de and be disciplined to control our spending growth, and we're doing that. More importantly, the investments that are being made in our youth, in our infrastructure, that's stimulating jobs, that's stimulating economic growth. That is what's going to make us competitive in the long term. That you should be supporting, Mr. Speaker, because it's for the benefit of all Ontarians. Finance Minister, this is a budget written by the Liberals to buy NDP support. It's uh, clearly a budget uh, written to try to uh, maintain your grips on power, uh, to maintain your office space. And, and I think of the young graduates from college or university who are deep in tuition debt. They're back home with mom and dad with no job to go to, and they thought they'd be better off by now. Out on their own, Mr. Speaker, buying their own home, their own career. This budget fails to help them because their budget goal is to buy support of the NDP to maintain office. And last time we saw this, Speaker, last time we saw the Liberal NDP coalition, we had a credit downgrade. We actually added on 48,000 jobs to the public sector payroll and lost 5,000 manufacturing jobs. Minister, people don't want to see a bidding war for more spending. They want to see a action plan for spending less. Why do you disagree? Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, this is very much a budget about helping create jobs and promoting economic growth. It's very clear as how we achieve that. It's also a budget about helping people in their everyday lives. So, what's at stake, Mr. Speaker, is this. Here we are helping rural and northern communities with a dedicated fund to help. I'll rein it in. Finish, please. Here we have a, 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 a dedicated fund to help rural communities with Remember their roads and bridges and commitments. We also have a gas tax that we're making permanent and dedicated to the municipalities. The member opposite just spoke about the youth, and he wants to cut off our youth fund, which is there to support an integration of businesses with 
young people, helping them be, uh, build on their skills, provide Answer. for entrepreneurial training, and enabling them to succeed so that they can be at work more quickly for the benefit of their future, Mr. Speaker. It's their future Thank that's you. at stake, Mr. Speaker. They should Thank be supporting you. this budget for that. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, our plan will actually bring jobs back to the province of Ontario. A good province of Ontario, jobs, and people can advance their skills, not a bigger government bureaucracy. Um, you know, there's an expression, uh, Minister, um, that you've heard, I know, that says basically that time is money, and we're rapidly running out of both. You made a deliberate decision in your budget to dig the hole deeper. You're adding $20 billion to debt, and bizarrely, you actually have made the deficit larger than the previous fiscal year. And quite frankly, this ongoing dance last couple of weeks of budget bribery between the Liberals and the NDP, that's not going to bring one new job back to the province of Ontario. I know what I'm doing. Um, it's on the edge. And so I would ask him to be cautious of how he uh, uses his words, please. Speaker. You've already caved in to a billion dollars in, in new spending for the Question. NDP. This dance is continuing. You've not said no to date, uh, Finance Minister. Are you going to say no to any more spending that will dig the hole even deeper? Thank you. Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, let's be clear. We have over 400,000 net new jobs since the recession. We're taking steps in this budget to create even more jobs. And it's highlighted as how we're going to achieve just that. The opposition don't have a plan. Their plan, Mr. Speaker, is across the board cuts, a slash and burn policy that will hamper our economic recovery. That is very sensitive right now. What is necessary is not more government, and I agree. It's about more opportunity. And we're providing more opportunity in this budget. We are doing transformational changes to help Ontarians succeed. The member opposite, by his own admission, is, is more intent on creating havoc and destroy labour relations and enabling cuts that will Answer. hinder our recovery, Mr. Speaker. We won't stand for that. We're there to support Ontarians. Thank you. Right New through. question. The Leader of the Third Party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, I want to start also on behalf of New Democrats, uh, wishing our condolences to the friends and family of uh, Peter Worthington and also, in fact, uh, to Mr. Takar, uh, the member for I don't know what his writing is, but the former minister who, uh, of course, has had uh, loss with his, uh, his mother's death and is suffering some ill health. We wish him uh, a speedy recovery, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, my question is to the Deputy Premier. Uh, people have had their faith shaken by scandals and billions of dollars of waste at eHealth, at Orange, and on the gas plants. Does the Deputy Premier agree that Ontarians are going to need to see uh, something different than the same old status quo if they're going to be able to trust the government again? Deputy Premier. What I think that the um, uh, thank you, Speaker, and what, what I think the people of this province really want is a decision to be made on whether this budget is moving forward or not. It is time for the leader of the third party to sit down with the premier and talk about supporting this budget, Speaker. You know who's waiting? I can tell you who's waiting for these answers. We've got nine million drivers in this province who are waiting to see whether or not we're going to be addressing the cost of their insurance premiums. We've got 30,000 young people who are really struggling to find that first job, who are waiting for the leader of the third party to determine whether or not they're going to get the help they need to get established in their careers. Speaker, 46,000 seniors and Answer. their loved ones are waiting for the NDP to find out whether they're going to get access to the home care that they need. Two supplementary. Well, Speaker, I would say there's over 13 million Ontarians that want to see a government they can trust for a change in this province. New Democrats have been very clear. We are focused on delivering real results for families. People have heard governments make promises before, but they've seen those promises broken, and they're also seeing scarce resources wasted. They want to see a government that's truly accountable to them, and they want to see the tools in place that will ensure that accountability. Speaker, is the minister ready to consider this? Well, Speaker, what I can tell you is that we 
we are absolutely ready to have that conversation that we've been waiting for a couple of months to have with the leader of the third party. But in the meantime, other Ontarians are waiting for answers, Speaker. You know who else is waiting? The parents of kids in, in low-income families who are waiting to see whether or not the Ontario Child Benefit is going to be increased this year. People are waiting. Those almost one million children who benefit from the Ontario Child Benefit are waiting Order. for an answer. Uh, Speaker, people on social assistance are waiting for an answer. Are they going to be able to keep more of their earnings? Are they going to be able to have that opportunity to move off social assistance and into employment where they desperately want to go? They are waiting for an answer from the leader of the third party. Speaker, people in northern and rural communities are waiting answer. for an answer. Are they going to get the money they need to take pressure off their municipal taxes, to build the roads, to build the bridges? People are waiting for an answer. Thank you. This time we had one. Final supplementary. Speaker, what people are waiting for is real results, and that's what New Democrats are determined to get them. <laughs> Ontarians want to have their voices heard, Speaker, and they told us that they don't think that the government has learned their lessons at eHealth, at Orange, and at the gas plants. They're worried that this government is going to go on wasting their money and then cutting important services to make up the difference. A financial, a financial accountability office speaker could help us to stop these scandals before they start. An ombudsman oversight into the health care system will stop the next chemotherapy crisis before it happens. Does the acting premier agree that more oversight is needed, or does she think that the status quo is good enough for the people of Ontario? Uh, speaker, I think it's very important that we move forward on accountability measures, and that's exactly what we are doing. I also think it's time for the leader of the third party to have that face-to-face -face conversation that the Premier has been asking for for some time. We can have the conversations in question period. We can have them through the media, Speaker. I think it's time for that sit-down meeting. The people of this province are waiting for an answer. Are we going forward with the initiatives in this budget that are very, very meaningful to everyday people in their everyday lives, or are we going to continue to play the game of let's, uh, let's play this out in the media and in question period? It's time for a decision, Speaker. The time is now. Thank you. New question. Leader of the third party. My next question is for the Acting Premier. Is the minister ready to give Ontario seniors in hospitals and those receiving home care access to the same oversight and protection as people have in our prison system, Speaker? Uh, speaker, it's very important that, uh, that people, when they need health care, uh, have the assurance that they are getting high quality health care. They're also, uh, people of this province deserve to know that they're getting the best value for the money that they're spending in health care. Uh, on health care speaker, and that's why we are moving forward with transforming the way the health care system is funded and how health care is delivered. And our budget really speaks to this, Speaker. We are moving resources into the community sector so people can get home care faster, they can get home care, the home care that they need, so they can get out of hospital, back home where they want to be, where they can stay home, Speaker longer than uh, uh, so that they don't have to move into long-term care prematurely speaker this budget speaks to the to the uh, health care needs of the people of this province thank you supplementary well, Speaker, Ontario's Ombudsman provides accountability in our prison system, but he doesn't have oversight in our health care system. In every other province, provincial ombudspersons have the power to advocate for patients and provide them with accountability. Will the minister consider doing the same for Ontario patients? Well, Speaker, as, as the Premier has said, the, uh, the leader of the NDP has put forward some interesting ideas, and she wants to talk about those ideas, Speaker. It's time to have that face-to-face -face conversation. We've responded to a number of the NDP requests that overlapped with our priorities, too, Speaker, because we are absolutely committed to, to addressing issues that are facing the people of this province. The, member, uh, the leader of the third party continues to add. To, uh, to the list of requests, I think it's time for a conversation between the Premier and the leader of the third party. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's disturbing. I really don't think that the, uh, the acting Premier gets it. Families watched as governments dropped the ball at Orange and wasted a billion dollars at eHealth 
helping their friends. Then Ontarians watched as over a thousand people were given the wrong cancer medication. Now the government's promising that they're going to hit a target of five days wait time for home care and that the quality of hospital care is not going to suffer as hospitals close facilities and lay off staff. Will the minister admit that people actually deserve some real oversight, some real accountability when it comes to their health care system and give the Ombudsman of Ontario the power to provide that accountability for patients? Mr. Speaker, as I have said, the Premier has acknowledged that the leader of the third party has some interesting ideas that she's continuing to put forward, and she's prepared to have that conversation where it belongs in a face-to-face -face meeting with the leader of the third party. In the meantime, we need to move forward with this budget, Speaker, because people are counting on us to get this job done. There are people who are waiting too long for home care. We acknowledge that, and we've got a, 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 we're on our way to address that challenge, Speaker, through this budget. 46,000 more people. Think about that for a minute. 46,000 more people will be able to access the home care they need so they can get back on their feet faster, they can get home from hospital faster, they can avoid going into long-term care, Speaker. But we need this budget to pass to be able to Answer. increase that access to home care. You, new question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Uh, Deputy, the Premier likes to take credit for starting the auditor's investigation into the Oakville debacle. But the truth of the matter is our Public Accounts Committee tried to get the auditor to probe both Mississauga and Oakville last September 5th. However, the Liberal members blocked that through procedures in committee. They ran the clock out on the committee, allowing only the Mississauga investigation. We should have known, Speaker, then just how bad Oakville was going to be. The truth is that if it weren't for the Liberal tactics, followed by prorogation, we'd have the auditor's here, report here. on Oakville by now. The Liberal Party continues to put their own interests ahead of taxpayers and must be put to a test Question. of confidence. Will you support our motion for non-confidence to be held in this, in this legislature? Mr. Speaker, I, uh, Mr. Speaker I, I'd like to inform members that on February 7th of this year, the new Premier, in fact, she had just become the new Premier, wrote the Auditor General and asked him to look into right. the Oakville situation. Yeah. I would also remind members that it was the new Premier who offered a select committee on this issue, which they rejected in favour of a witch hunt Morgan against a former member of the Legislature. It was the new Premier who asked Liberal members of the committee to put forward a motion to have a very wide document search across this province, and to my astonishment, Mr. Speaker, that very member, his colleagues and the colleagues of the Democratic Party voted, no. voted against it. Mr. Speaker, the Premier has been forthcoming. She has appeared in front of the committee, the something we haven't Order. heard from the Leader of the Opposition yet. I understand he may be there tomorrow Answer. morning. We certainly look forward to that. So. But, Mr. Speaker, there are no apologies when it comes to the openness of the Premier of this province when it comes to this issue. Thank you, Speaker. It's amazing how the Liberals talk about the race to the moon but lead the race to the bottom, Speaker. Here, here. The Liberal record on these gas plant cancellations is telling. A snap decision 11 days before an election to save Liberal seats, side deals totaling Order. tens of millions of dollars to keep the proponents from exposing you, a deliberate move to withhold documents requested by members of this House, and finally, sworn testimony, Speaker, of documents being destroyed. If this is the Liberal idea of responsible government, I can tell you no one else in Ontario shares that view. This scandal should not be rewarded, Speaker, certainly not by the third party. Will you bring our non-confidence motion to the floor Question. this week? Here, here. 
Mr. Speaker, when the, the honourable member spoke about a snap decision before an election to support the cancellation of the plan, I, I think he was talking about his own party, Mr. That's Speaker. Right. Because if I recall correctly, it was the leader of the opposition, the star of that famous YouTube video, who came out and talked about their support for the cancellation of the project. It was the candidates in the various ridings that were affected who put out robocalls, dropped leaflets, put YouTube. out press releases, put out statements on Twitter saying the Twitter only press. way to see the end of this plan was to elect the Progressive Conservatives uh, to government. And the question, Mr. Speaker, is why, why are they blocking their own candidates from coming before the committee so that they can answer questions about why they made that decision, what motivated that decision, the types of costing that was put in place? As I said, Mr. Speaker, we may hopefully Answer. see the Leader of the Opposition in front of the committee tomorrow, and we look forward to him discussing with us why he made that decision and why he's so aggressively opposed Thank you. the plan, Mrs. Saga. The member from Trinity East Medina. My question is to the Minister of uh, Transportation. Uh, last week, I asked the Minister for details about his government's plan to implement high occupancy toll lanes, but I don't think I got an answer, so I'm going to ask it again. The KPMG report to Metrolink said it costs about $700,000 to implement one kilometre of high, occup high occupancy toll lanes. That means we're talking about 300, over $300 million to create 450 kilometres of hot lanes, and that's if everything goes perfectly. But Metrolink puts the initial revenue from HOTs at a mere $25 million a year and says that the HOT lanes are not a significant source of revenue for transit. Why is the province building a risky, costly and complicated new payment system for the sake of a mere $25 million a year? Question. Thank you. Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, the budget elaborates two things. The budget elaborates a very dramatic expansion of HOV lanes, which are for high occupancy vehicles only. The, the, Mr. Speaker, the budget also says that we are going to explore and develop. I guess the race for the bottom is continuing, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, we're also looking at HOT lanes. We are looking at the experiences of other jurisdictions. In some places, they've been very successful at alleviating congestion in certain conditions, Mr. Speaker. We are not rushing into anything. We are carefully looking at the experience of other jurisdictions, and, and Metrolinx will be looking at the optimum uh, implementation of these in locations and places where they make, make sense, Mr. Speaker. HOT lanes also serve the full purposes of an HOV lane in addition to opening it up to additional drivers in certain Thank situations, you. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. I, I mentioned that it would cost over $300 million to implement the government's new tolling scheme if everything goes perfectly well. But such schemes have not gone perfectly with this government, and I'm reminded of Presto. Presto was originally budgeted at $250 million, but the costs have now ballooned to over $700 million. A big cost to the taxpayer, but a wonderful benefit to the government's partners in the private sector. And we have already begun the process of, uh, uh, of integrating Presto with the TTC. Why should we believe that the government's new tolling scheme will not join eHealth, Orange, the gas plant scandal, and Presto on the growing list of this government's wasteful private sector misadventures? Minister. Mr. Speaker, this government's spending on services is the lowest per capita in Canada, which means that it's lower than any of the provinces in which the third party is in power. Second, Mr. Speaker, the HOT lane proposals have not been developed yet. There has been no preparation in detail about where or how or what technologies would be used, so it's a little premature to jump to those conclusions, Mr. Speaker. Finally, Mr. Speaker, I remember the good old days when my friends in the NDP liked transit, when they actually understood that subways and LRTs actually cost money, Mr. Speaker. We have. We're the member from the P and Carleton, come to order, please. Please finish. 
I know the official opposition really gets a little cranky, Mr. Speaker, when we talk about subways because their only record in doing them is filling them in. And they like to say they like GoTrans, Mr. Speaker. They just never fund it. Mr. Speaker, if we actually are going to deal with the congestion problems, governments are going to have to be honest with the people of Ontario and work with them to find Thank the you. right funding tools to move this forward, Mr. Speaker. This party will do that. New question, the member from Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you, Speaker. This question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. The 2013-14 Ontario budget is a forward-looking document that moves Ontario steadily toward a balanced budget. Much of the conversation on the budget has focused on issues affecting cities and southern Ontario municipalities such as Toronto, Mississauga, Brampton, Windsor, Kingston and Ottawa. And the Ontario budget is also a document that speaks to the concerns of northern Ontarians. Northern needs include stable and affordable electricity, secure jobs and a reliable infrastructure. Would the minister tell the House what Ontario's budget does to help municipalities in northern Ontario become stronger, more sustainable and more prosperous places to live, work and raise a family? Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague for the question. There's far too much uh, interaction going on between uh, the, hall, the ways and also within themselves. Please uh, bring it down. Thank you. Minister. Again, Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for the question, and I'd like to reassure this chamber that our government listens to all of the people of Ontario, and we continue that dialogue on last Friday when I and the Ministers of Natural Resources, Northern Development and Mines, Rural Affairs, Aboriginal Affairs, and the Premier attended the Federation of Northern Ontario Municipalities' 53rd Annual Conference and General Meeting, which was held in Parry Sound, and we let them know that we heard their concerns. That's why, if the parties opposite support our budget, in 2013 and 14, we will spend $553 million on northern highways, and we will Answer. create a $1 million uh, fund for small, rural and northern municipalities to help them build roads, bridges and other critical infrastructure, and spend $360 million Thank to you. extend the northern oh. industrial electricity rate. Supplementary. Minister, Northern Ontarians need an update on how this province has acted to reverse the downloading of the 1990s. Have these costs been uploaded again to the province, where they belong, and removed from the tax base of Northern Ontario municipalities, where they never belonged? What does the recent Ontario budget mean for Northern Ontario municipalities and the pressure they face on their municipal tax bases? Would you give property owners, ratepayers, and members of the more than 400 municipal councils in Northern Ontario an indication of what the 2013-14 Ontario budget holds in store for them? Thank you, Minister. Good thank you, question. Speaker, and I want to thank the member again for the question. I firmly believe that what the Premier has said on numerous times, that Ontario, in order for Ontario to be prosperous, that all of our communities need Going to be prosperous. To That's why we've continued our conversation with Northern municipalities about how we can help them out. And we've heard what they've told us and we've acted. That's why in 2012 and 13, Northern Ontario municipalities will benefit from $337 million in municipal sports through the Ontario Municipal Partnership Fund and our commitment to uploading. This means real relief uh, for municipal budgets and it's taking a huge burden off property taxes across the North. Our budget will continue to provide assistance to northern communities and for all municipalities across Ontario. And I look forward to working with 444 municipalities across the province to learn how we can better help them become stronger and more prosperous. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from the Carleton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Uh, we know that the Premier is, is now preparing to give further ground to the New Democrats in secret budget vote negotiations, and we know that his government passed out a, a checklist of NDP demands on Budget Day, and we know that the Premier likes to keep secret negotiations and backroom deals after we saw what happened with the gas plants and, of course, uh, teacher union bosses. So, Given all that, can you tell us here today how much more spending we can expect in order for the New Democratic Party to prop your government up? Minister Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, we're very clear that our 
Our spending is being controlled. It's being disciplined. It's less than 1 percent year over year. It's how we're achieving results. But my question to the member opposite, how do you justify, how do you justify a leader who's put out information from your party that talks about these very issues that you're telling me, and it doesn't add up? And you're promoting numbers that don't equate. And you want the legitimacy of somehow telling the people of Ontario that you can lead when you can't even add. Answer me that, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, I'm quite comfortable standing behind Tim Hudak when he becomes Premier of Ontario in a few short months. And the only spending that's being controlled today, Speaker, in this assembly is by the New Democratic Party, and they're telling you what to spend on, and you're saying, yes, I'll give you a little bit more. This is an NDP budget for the NDP so that this government can be propped up. But, Speaker, let's talk a second about the economy. There's an old expression, it's the economy, Sousa. Let's, uh, let's get back on track here, Speaker. But uh, we, let's, let's be perfectly honest here. This is a government that only values democracy insofar as saving their own political skins. After ne negotiations with rogue union leaders, we know that there is not enough money in this world that they can say no to. We know that they only value the truth when they have been caught. So I want to know what dirty deal has this government cooked up with the NDP in order for the NDP to continue calling the shots? Question government to continue to be propped up. Thank you. Thank you. Minister Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, the only deal that we're making here is a deal with the people of Ontario. Yeah. This is a budget that speaks to the people of Ontario, the contribution that they have made, because what they want is leadership. And what they don't want is extreme views. They do not want to see an excessive slash and burn policy that puts things at risk. And they do want and they do not want excessive spending. They want control and they want discipline. We're offering that. And Mr. Speaker, it is about the economy. The members opposite don't Morning. seem to understand Morning. that the economy's recovery is challenged, and we need to take steps to stimulate that growth. So there are occasions when you have to provide support for our youth, for our infrastructure, for those most vulnerable, for the things that we all share in common in this House. It boggles yes, my mind that you would put that at risk, Mr. Speaker. You should be supporting Thank this budget. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Mr. As racetracks across Ontario close down, it's clear that your OLG privatization plan is in shambles. One day Toronto is getting a special deal to host a downtown casino, the next day it isn't. One day there's a transition program for the horse racing industry, the next day there's a new committee that's going to start the process all over again. Will this government admit? that its OLG privatization strategy was a disaster from day one and that it's time to put this complete stop uh, uh, put a complete stop to this mess. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to the Minister of Finance. Finance. So Mr. Speaker, we all know that uh, Transforming OLG is an essential part of trying to enhance our revenue, support our schools and our education, and ensure that we continue to be socially conscious and socially responsible in those initiatives. This modernization plan is, is on the right track to take those and to deliver on that promise. But, Mr. Speaker, in regard to transition around racing, in regard to our transition around service delivery, we need to be methodic, we need to be careful. We recognize that those initiatives were initially brought forward by the opposition in terms of an OLG component, but now we need to transform them, and we're taking those appropriate steps to ensure that we protect the people of Ontario. Supplementary. Speaker, I, I, I really don't think the government has any clue what they're doing in terms of their modernization strategy because rural Ontario has been dealt a massive blow with the decision to cancel the slots at racetrack program. Thousands of jobs have been lost in rural Ontario, and thousands more will be lost in the near future. Meanwhile, the OLG invited gambling operations to bid on a downtown casino and tried to entice Toronto City Council members with a, street, a sweetheart deal on a hosting formula. Will this government admit that its privatization plan is a complete disaster and end this sorry spectacle once and for all. Mr. Finance. Uh, the Minister of Rural Affairs, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Rural Affairs. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. 
And you know, our government is committed for a sustainable horse racing industry in the province of Ontario. We appointed three very distinguished former members of this House, the Honourable Albert Buchanan. And in fact, uh, I had the opportunity, he served on the benches over there, one of Ontario's most successful ag ministers from 1990 to 1995. I actually spoke to Mr. Buchanan last Saturday. I was at Havelock, Ontario for Celebrate Havelock. And Mr. Buchanan and Mr. Stoblin and Mr. Wilkinson are doing an incredible job to provide a framework the from to Essex sustain horse the racing question. in the I'm province sure of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, I invite my friends opposite to join me this Saturday at Quartha Downs in Peterborough for the first race. I recommend that they bet Yankee Dick in the sixth. I think Thank that's you. a very hot prospect, Mr. Speaker. Your question, the member from Scarborough Range and Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Across Ontario, in my riding of Scarborough Asian Court, we are concerned about the Aboriginal youth, which is recognized as Canada's fastest growing potential workforce. Almost half of Aboriginal people, First Nation, Inuits, and Metis in Canada are under the age of 24. Mr. Speaker, constantly we're hearing the concerns of high dropout rates for the First Nation youth living off reserve. Metis and Inuits youth are 22.6 percent, more than two and a half times the rate of non-Aboriginal youth. We need to ensure that all youth have an equal and fair opportunity to be successful. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can the Minister inform the House what Ontario is doing to narrowing the gaps? Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. Uh, thank you for that question. Look, uh, properly educating and providing for the proper education and closing the education gaps between our Aboriginal communities, both on and off reserves, is absolutely crucial to developing the, uh, the health and the well-being of the Aboriginal community. In that regard, I was in Winnipeg about a month ago at the Aboriginal Affairs Working Group. Uh, Ontario had chaired that for the past four years. Manitoba is the chair this year. One of the issues that we discussed at that, uh, at that conference was this whole issue of closing the dropout rates and the educational uh, achievement metrics of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities. There was a recognition across the board by all of the provinces and all of the territories that this had to be done. This was the right thing to do. But you know, Answer. Speaker, who was missing from that uh, meeting in Winnipeg was the federal Government. The federal Thank you. government was not there. Thank you. This is a gap. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is good to know that actions taken on this very important issue. Speaker, another very important issue is the violence again. Uh, the member from Renfrew, I've been tolerant of you continually shouting people's names out, and I'm not going to be tolerant any longer. Would you please uh, either call them by their title or their writing? Thank you. Speaker, another very important issue is the violence against Aboriginal women and girls. I heard that about 15 per cent of Aboriginal women in Canada had a spouse or common law partners in the past five years reporting being a victim of spousal violence, more than twice the proportion among the non-Aboriginal women. I read that missing and murdered Aboriginal women represent about 10 per cent of female homicides in Canada, despite the fact that Aboriginal women made up only 3 per cent of the total female population in Canada. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, what is Ontario doing Question. to address this issue in Ontario in the context of the national uh, national context? Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, first, let me put a human face to those statistics. At a recent meeting, I think it was in Sault Ste. Marie, and we heard about this in Winnipeg, there was a meeting of some 230, 231 women. The Speaker at that conference asked uh, the the non-Aboriginal women to stand up, and about 200 of them stood up, and then she said, please raise your hand if any of you have had a sister or a grandmother or a wife uh, who has been murdered, and one person put up their hand. She then asked the 31 Aboriginal women in the audience to stand up and ask the same question. Of the 31 of you, how many have a female relative who has been murdered or is missing? And of the 31 who stood up, 29 raised their hands. 29 out of 31. One out of 200 for the non-Aboriginal community. Right, this sir. is a tragedy. 
This has to stop. The Aboriginal Affairs Working Group in Winnipeg has called on a national inquiry into this issue of violence and missing Aboriginal women. Ontario is pleased to support Thank that you. call. Amen. More questions? The member from Haldeman, Norfolk. Speaker, to the uh, Deputy Premier, I was at U.S. Steel in Anticoke last night. A thousand steel workers locked out. Third lockout in three years between Lake Erie and the Hamilton Works. A thousand steel jobs support 4,000 others, and up to 9,000 jobs can be affected. Ontario has already lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs. Look at London. Deputy Premier, what are you doing about these lockouts? A government mediator was involved. I asked your government, what does the mediator do? And I was told that can't be divulged. What is he doing? What are you doing? Have you talked to the company? Have you talked to the union? What steps are you taking to get steelworkers back to work? To the Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And I, I thank the member opposite for, for raising an important question. Speaker, uh, I think as we all know, some negotiations are very challenging and uh, some take place in the public eye. I want to commend uh, all uh, those who represent employers uh, and, and unions at the negotiating table. They've come together to develop a strategy that could work for, for both of them. We know, Speaker, that agreements that are reached around the negotiating table are the, the best one. And we really encourage in this situation for both parties to come back to the table. As the member uh, opposite noted, and the uh, Ministry of Labor mediator has been engaged uh, in the negotiations. The mediator has been assisting the parties and has met with the parties on seven, seven different occasions. Our services are still available. We encourage the parties to come back to the negotiating table. We are willing to facilitate that conversation and come up with a negotiated settlement yes, that will be in the best interest of all parties. Thank yeah, you, Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Well, Ontario's got 600,000 people out of work. Jobs are fleeing the province. Look at London, 9.9% unemployment. Caterpillar closed Electromotive and moved to Indiana. Now they're closing Toronto, moving to Michigan. And here we have the third U.S. steel lockout in three years. What have you learned from that? What have you done? I've been talking to the union. I've been talking to the company. We have government for a reason. Will you personally pull all sides together, at least call a meeting, personally? The steel business has changed. Your approach has not changed. You're getting rusty. Please explain, what are you doing to deal with this new reality, not only in the steel business, but in Ontario's manufacturing in general? Question. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I think the member opposite knows exactly how the labor relations process works, where both parties need to come together on their own, on their own will around the table, and be able to negotiate a settlement. Minister, I think the uh, Speaker, I think the member opposite also knows that the the role of the government or that of the Ministry of Labor is that to mediate or facilitate that conversation. And our mediators are available. They have they have participated in the process on seven different occasions, and they are willing to get the parties back. But the both parties have to agree to do so. Now, Speaker, what's concerning is the approach that the party opposite continues to raise, and that is uh, their right to work for less strategy. We know, Speaker, that approach does not work either. So I ask the, I ask the member to uh, stop advocating for a system uh, that will take, uh, will take a race to the bottom for workers, but ensure yes, that sir. we have a robust labor relations process like we have in the Ontario Labor Relations Act. And I encourage both parties, in the case of U.S. Steel Canada, Thank Lake Area Works, to come together and negotiate a final Thank settlement. Thank you. Here, here. Question, the member from London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Just over a week ago in London, Andrea Horvath and I met with a group of distraught Londoners who are the victims of yet another damaging cut to health care. Despite all the talk about health care transformation, this Liberal government's cuts to health care has led to the closure of St. Joseph's Hydrotherapy Pool, a unique and vital therapy service for patients. Will the minister explain how she can encourage people to be active? Then cut hydrotherapy then cut this hydrotherapy program with no regard for the consequences 
Thank you, Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, Speaker, um, thanks uh, to the member from London Fanshawe for that question. And uh, uh, this hospital, of course, is in my riding, so I know this, uh, this issue well. We are embarking in a very important and serious transformation of our health care system. We are committed to moving services that are currently de delivered in hospital to the community whenever possible. We're changing how we fund hospitals so that going forward, hospitals are going to get the money. Their budget is going to depend on how many people they serve, uh, how, what their community is, and how many actual procedures that they perform. Speaker, there are changes underway. It's all about delivering the best possible, highest quality care in the most appropriate place. Speaker, hospitals are making difficult Answer. decisions. I understand that. But the goal, Speaker, is better care for the people of this province, and that includes the people of London. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, St. Joseph's Hydrotherapy Pool is health care, too. Patients in London and across Ontario want to see accountability in our health care system, accountability measures like the Ombudsman oversight over the health care system that would prevent harmful cuts like this one. Will the minister please explain to Londoners why her government can spend recklessly billions of dollars on scandals like eHealth, Orange, Mississauga and Oakville gas plants, but can't afford to keep St. Joseph's hydrotherapy pool open? Uh, speaker, um, the, uh, the member opposite, unfortunately, is not looking at the whole picture. This budget that we have presented in this House, that her um, party is uh, so far dithering on whether or not they will support, Speaker, speaks to improving health care for the people of this province, including the people she represents. This budget expands home care to 46,000 more Ontarians, Speaker. This is the kind of transformation that, uh, that we must all support because our Order. Patients, the patients of this province, if they're ready to go home from hospital, Speaker, that's where they want to be, and we need to be there to support them at home. Speaker, people want to be home. They want to be able Answer. to be in the comfort of their own community with the people that they love, and this budget is going to help more people get the care they need Thank so you. they can be where they want to be. Thank you. A new question? A member from Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Minister, in a few weeks, families in my riding of Mississauga East Cooksville are going to be celebrating, celebrating the fact that young men and women are about to graduate from universities and colleges. And regardless of whether they are graduating from a university or a college, I know that these kids are really well positioned for the job market because they have a post-secondary education. But Minister, not every young graduate wants to look for a job. Instead, they want to go into business for themselves. What I want to know is, if you're going into business for yourself, you cannot be worried about having to pay your OSAP loan. I'd like to know what this government is doing to help young entrepreneurs defer payment on their OSAP loans. Minister of Training College Universities. That's a really good question, uh, Mr. Speaker. And there, there's nothing more inspiring than this new next generation of young Ontario entrepreneurs coming out of our colleges and universities. Uh, Mr. Speaker, when you see some of these young people and you go around the world today, they're seen as some of the best and brightest young entrepreneurs anywhere in the world today. Uh, and you know, when you think about starting a, young, a, a, a business up as you're graduating from university, is not only tough physically, it's tough financially as well. So we want to give our young entrepreneurs a break. The 2013 budget will, if passed, allow graduates choosing to start a business in Ontario to defer paying off OSAP loans and payment of interest until one year after completing post-secondary education, rather than the standard six-month grace period. This will support young entrepreneurs across the province as they work to build their careers, turning them from job seekers to job creators. But, Mr. Speaker, we need to get this budget passed yes, in order to achieve that. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that great answer for on making sure that our young people have the opportunity not just to seek jobs, but to also create jobs. 
But Speaker, there's also a lot of young people looking for jobs in my riding of Mississauga East Cooksville, and I know that this government has been working hard to help these young, bright graduates. Can the minister tell this legislature what we are doing to help young graduates find jobs? Minister. Absolutely, Mr. Speaker. One of the barriers our graduates and young people face upon entering the job market is lack of experience, and it's the old adage we've heard before. You know, you can't get a job without experience, and you can't get experience without having a job. So it's it's kind of tough. They're kind of in that no-win situation. We need to take action to help our young people get the opportunity to enter the workforce. This is a top priority in our 2013 budget, and I urge all members, all sides of the House, to pass this budget, Mr. Speaker, because our budget will launch Ontario's youth job strategy, including a youth employment fund of $195 million over two years. The province would provide hiring incentives to employers to offer young people in all regions of the province an entry point to long-term employment. The fund would use Ontario's Employment Ontario ex extensive network of employment yes, and training services across the province to find appropriate job pay, uh, uh, job placements, Mr. Speaker. We've got to get this budget passed though, in order to implement this. No question. The member from Lincoln, Kate Middlesex. Thank you uh, very much, Speaker. My question is for the uh, Deputy Premier. Four months ago, Liberal insiders and special interests coronated Ontario's Premier. At that time, Ontario's unemployment stood at 565,000 people. Fast forward to today, and sadly, you will know that Ontario's unemployment situation is even more dismal. Worse still, over the past 12 months, Ontario's government sector has grown by 48,000 people, but we haven't added one net new job to the Ontario economy. In fact, during this time, we've lost over 5,000 well-paying manufacturing jobs, which the Premier often refers to as a myth. Do you think it's right to force unemployed Ontario residents to pay for your political decision to move gas plants in Mississauga and Oakville to save a few Liberal Question. jobs and buy the last provincial election? Speaker, I'm the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Sir, Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I know he might not say it in here, but I know outside of the legislature, the member opposite believes that we're on the right track in this province. Because, because the reality is, and he knows this, that last month alone we created 9,000 new manufacturing jobs in this province. And the, and the, and the member opposite knows as well that in the last few years since Order. Thank you. So not only 9,000 new manufacturing jobs last month alone created in this province, but we're on the right track because we've created over 400,000 new jobs since the bottom of the recession. We've brought back, Mr. Speaker, all of the jobs that were lost, and 50 per cent more. And you compare that with other jurisdictions like the United States that has only brought back 70 per cent of their jobs. We're doing better than the United States. We're doing better than the Great Lakes states Thank you. around us as well. That's great. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, clearly, Minister, you need to get out of Queen's Park more. Right, so the Speaker, whole back to the Deputy the Premier. Sadly, the numbers in London are even more devastating. The unemployment rate in London soared from a dismal 8.6 per cent in January to a devastating 9.9 per cent last month, giving London the highest big city unemployment rate in the country for the second month in a row. In Windsor, the unemployment rate is now at 9.2 per cent. Minister, the stats don't lie. Job creators in southwestern Ontario no longer have confidence in your Liberal government's ability to help create jobs and grow our economy. With one in ten London residents unemployed, do you think it's right to ask unemployed Londoners to pay for your political decision right. to move the Oakville and Mississauga power plants to buy Liberal seats in the last election? Here, here. Well, Mr. Speaker, again, I know just how difficult it was for the member opposite to actually express that question, because he knows as well as I do that the reason we created the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund was to address important yeah. issues like this. And I, I hate, I hate to embarrass him, but I got to bring up again the first project that was funded, in fact, by the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund, a fund that the members and the official opposition voted against, was it, was in your writing. 
I'm sorry it was in your riding. It was in Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, and I'm so proud that Lambton Conveyor, with support from the Ontario government through this very fund, is not only doubling its workforce, doubling. Wow. but it is contributing to an important local co economy, and I know the member opposite in his heart of hearts agrees with me. Answer, thank you. The member from Kamiskamee Conference. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. On Saturday, the weatherman was calling for snow across northeastern Ontario, and a heavy snow is not uncommon in May in our part of the world. And they got, in Timmins, 26 centimetres. Wow. The OPP closed many highways across the north after a dozen accidents. Fortunately, there were no, no fatalities. There were a couple cruisers in the ditch. They didn't close the highways because of the snow. They closed the highways because of a total lack of snow clearing. There was no snow plowing. There was one snow plow between Highway 144 and Matheson. That's an area bigger than some countries. There was no maintenance at all. Once again, snow in the spring is not that uncommon. This is the second time that we've had to ask that question. You know, are the contracts not up to snuff? Are the contractors not following the rules? Thank you. Are they not being paid enough? Or is the privatization scheme not? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I will be uh, very, very happy to review what happened on the weekend. I appreciate the member's question. I think it was sincerely asked. It was very unusual weather this weekend, Mr. Speaker. In my neighbourhood, we had hail three times and rain and snow. Uh, this was not the kind of weather that uh, one is used to. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have uh, raised this when I was at a uh, meeting with mayors in the north, and they have all said to me very clearly that this was one of the most difficult uh, winters for municipal snow removal services, Mr. Speaker, because of the irregularity of the weather and the challenges of the weather. Uh, so we know we've been dealing with some difficult matters, Mr. Speaker, but I do take the member's question as a sincere one. I will look into it and get back to him. I appreciate him raising it. To the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I wish to correct my record. Uh, earlier I spoke in an answer to the member uh, with regards to uh, a fund, a million dollar funds for small rural northern municipalities to build road bridges and other critical infrastructure. In fact, our budget speaks to a hundred million dollars oh. to do that work. Thank you, Speaker. That is a point of order. Members are allowed to correct the record. There are no deferred votes. This House stands deferred until 1 p.m. this afternoon. Recessed. <laughs> deferred. Recessed.